Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to, do to talk with broadcast journalist Emily Chang about her recently published bestseller, Brotopia, and maybe a few related topics. And I'm going to kind of switch the roles on Emily and ask her questions, and she's going to have to answer for a change. Emily is the anchor and executive producer of the television program Bloomberg Technology. She was born and raised on Oahu. Her mother, Sandy, was a teacher in Honolulu, and her dad was the local attorney, Laban Chang. Emily is in San Francisco right now, where she lives with her husband and three children. Aloha, Emily. I'm glad to see you. Uh, thank my, you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, my pleasure, and uh, thank you for, for making time. I know you have another show com coming up, so we're going to hit some questions right off the bat and get your answers. And uh, my first question is really two questions in one. What, what is Brotopia? Uh, what's the meaning of Brotopia? And what is your book about? I, I, I have re read your book, and I've learned a few things about it, about Brotopia, but please. Tell us. So, Protopia, in my mind, perfectly encapsulates this idea of Silicon Valley as a modern utopia where anyone can change the world, break the rules if you're a man. But if you're a woman, it's incomparably harder. And it shows in the numbers. I mean, Silicon Valley, women hold 25% of jobs across the industry. They represent only about 7% of venture capital investors. And companies led by women in Silicon Valley only get 2% of funding. And I hardly believe that's because women have only 2% of good ideas. And so, you know, the industry has been historically very male dominated, and that's a problem for. Um, an industry that is so influential, that is changing the world in so many ways and changing the way we live, we need to have women better represented in this world. So, Brotopia, is, is, that, your, is that your words? Are, the, are that a word you came up with? Is that your invention? Fun story. Uh, the book was originally called The Valley of Opportunity <laughs> in my original book proposal. And my publisher, about a year in, said, how about Brotopia? And, you know, at the time, I thought that maybe it was a little too strong. And I've been covering Silicon Valley for, you know, seven years, and I didn't want to be run out of this place. Um, but, you know, I think the last year has really shown, you know, that it's not an exaggeration. We've seen a lot of investors exposed for bad behavior. We've seen, you know, a brighter light shine on systemic discrimination that exists not only in Silicon Valley, but in business in general. And so, you know, I know it makes a strong statement, but I think people get what we're talking about right away. And now I love the title, and I don't think it is so much of an exaggeration. And, and, and well, you know, how long have you been, how long did you work on the book, and why did you, I mean, why did you feel it necessary? And you, you knew, I mean, you obviously knew you are going to get a reaction. Uh, it's, there's going to be a controversy. Yeah, I started writing the book two and a half years ago now. So this was before Trump was elected, before Me Too. And, you know, the representation of women in the industry has always been a problem, but it certainly could have been like a tree falling in the forest, this book. And the culture and the climate really changed over the course of my reporting. So I certainly benefited from that momentum. And I'm so grateful that the cultural conversation has made it possible uh, for a book like this to break through because, you know, sexism exists everywhere. Sexual harassment exists everywhere. But in Silicon Valley, you know, this is a place where people talk about changing the world. And in many ways, they have. But in this way, Silicon Valley is, is behind so many other industries. And I fully believe that the people who are, you know, taking us to Mars and building self-driving cars and connecting the world can hire women pay them fairly, promote them, and fund their ideas. And, and the source of your information, was this your own investigation or your interviews, or how, how did you, is this something that kind of played on you over time and your, your, these ideas came up, or? I interviewed 
interviewed over 300 people for this book. And, you know, I have a, a daily technology show where I get to interview influential people in Silicon Valley every single day. And as the years progressed, I became more bold about asking these questions. What are you doing to hire women? What are you doing to promote women? What are you doing to fund women? And um, sometimes the answer surprised me. In fact, there's one investor I quote in the book who said, well, we're looking for more women to hire, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. <laughs> and to me, that really shined a light on, on what the problem really is. You know, there are a lot of people, a lot of companies out there that think they have to lower their standards to hire women that aren't looking hard enough. And that interview was really the spark that lit the fire hmm. under me um, to write this book. I realized this wasn't an issue that could be tackled on television, that this was something that um, you know, really had to be explored in greater depth. And I learned so much that surprised me that I think will surprise a lot of people about how and why we got here. And only once we understand how and why we got here can we figure out what we can do to change it. Okay, and, and you're, you know, the, the, the subtitle of your book is Breaking Up the Boys Club of Silicon Valley. And, um, I, you know, I, I have a question. You see billions of dollars at least to, to the, the, us who look at Silicon Valley and the, and the tech industry, billions of dollars come in. What's, what do you need to break it up for? You know, what, what is, what's the answer to that? I mean, is it broken? It's so easy to say, why is there a problem? Because look at all of the great things Silicon Valley has created. Look at Facebook, look at Apple, look at Google. But I like to think about, you know, the women who never got a chance to start the next Facebook or the next Google or the ne next Apple and how different the world might be. You know, I interviewed Evan Williams, who's the co-founder of Twitter, and he told me that he thinks if there had been more women on the early Twitter team, mm -hmm. that maybe online harassment and trolling wouldn't be such a problem. They weren't thinking about this when they were building Twitter. They were thinking about wonderful and amazing things that could be done with Twitter, not how it could be used to send rape threats or death threats or propagate abuse. And so I wonder if the internet would be a friendlier place if women had had a seat at the table 30 years ago, if porn would be so ubiquitous, if video games would be so violent, if maybe we'd have better parental controls on things like YouTube. There's no way to definitively answer that question, but we shouldn't have to wait another 30 years to do so. Uh, how has how, how have the brothers and the sisters in Silicon Valley how, how have they reacted to to Brotopia? You know, I knew that this book would make some people uncomfortable, and no good change comes without some people feeling a little uncomfortable. I'd say there certainly is a minority voice out there that doesn't understand why this is a problem, doesn't doesn't think that anything needs to change, but the vast majority of people have been very supportive, have been very responsive. And I wrote this for the majority of people who may not understand how big the problem is, but want to help or know it's the problem, but don't know what to do. And I really just wanted to start a meaningful conversation. And maybe not everyone will agree with what I have to say, but hopefully they're willing to listen. And I'm willing to listen to them as well. And you know, it is about starting a conversation and having a healthy debate so we can get to a better place. And, you know, I've been very encouraged by companies like Amazon and Microsoft and LinkedIn and Google who have invited me to speak. Mm -hmm. And they could just as easily say, you wrote a book called Brotopia, no thank you. Right. But in fact, they're actually open to having these conversations. And I think that's, that's really important. You know, uh, I, I learned a little bit uh, obviously, uh, that I didn't know. I learned a lot, actually, and uh, a, a lot of background, and, and it made me think, and I've talked to some folks about this, uh, about the background of Brotopia and how we got there. Um, I, I was wondering, do you have some words of advice, you know, to the, how about, I know you have three children, you have a family, and you live in San Francisco. What words of advice would you give to the sister? who wants to have both a family and, and a successful career based on what you've learned and what you've, what you've written? So first of all, you can do it. And it's a matter of finding your team and finding your allies and finding people who will support you. And in fact, industries like Silicon Valley, the tech industry needs 
incredible women need smart and driven women. And so I do think there's a certain amount of leaning in and speaking up that, you know, all women have to do. But on the other hand, you can't lean in if the door is nailed shut. And so there are a lot of systemic changes that need to happen in the business world. And so if you have a company, if you run a company, change starts from the top. We need CEOs and prominent investors to make this, make building diverse teams a priority. We all need to listen to each other more, men and women. We need to mentor. We need to advocate for others. You know, if you, uh, you know, are, are in a room and you see your colleague being interrupted or being mansplained or whatever splained or not getting an opportunity that you believe that perhaps they should have, say something about it. We can't always expect the victim to speak up for themselves in that moment. You know, there's a certain amount of advocation that needs to happen by, by everyone. Um, so that we can lift each other up. Um, and, you know, I think if, if, if you're wanting to build a diverse company, this is not just about this being the right thing to do, which I believe it is. This is a smart thing to do. You know, diverse hmm. teams build better products, have better results, are more innovative, make more money. There is a business case to be had here. You don't want to miss something because there were no women in the room or no people of color. You don't want to have that blind spot. We all bring different perspectives to the table, no matter where where we come from, and those perspectives are really valuable. And and that advice would go to the brothers too, right? I mean, not, uh, that advice Absolutely. I hear you talking about that applies to everybody, brothers and sisters, as as we say here in Hawaii. <laughs> right. You know, the reality is that men are in positions of power right now, and they have the opportunity to pass that power. And I think that you know men need to go out of their way to find high potential women in their workplace and mentor them. And you know we can't be scared because of Me Too. I think we all know where the line is and the lines that that lines that shouldn't be crossed. And so you know we need to be part of this conversation together, men and women. Um, but you know I do think it is incumbent on men at this point. To you know, be you know a more active part of this conversation. Be aware I'm so too. By the, I'm so encouraged by the Me Too movement and the women's marches and the women speaking up louder than ever before. We need men to listen. And and be aware, I guess. I mean, uh, I think it's easy for Absolutely. for. I've just written 300 pages about the problem. We can no longer <laughs> say we didn't know. Ignorance can only be willful at this point. Okay, yeah, we have a, a, a few minutes left. I know you have to go to a new show that, that's coming on very soon. Uh, on, I, I guess it's, uh, you have to get prepared for that. Uh, give a f any other words that you'd like to say? I mean, I know you attended the, uh, the Mark Z Zuckerberg uh, uh, congressional he hearings, and you've also spoken very highly of uh, Sheryl Sandberg. At, at Facebook, and that, is that a is that a good example, or, or what, what? Do you have something to say about that? I was inside the hearings in Washington D.C. as Mark Zuckerberg was testifying before Congress. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think some of the lawmakers didn't ask the toughest questions, <laughs> and uh, it was a bit of a missed opportunity. And I, I do think Zuckerberg. Um, performed fairly well, um, but Facebook is in the middle of a firestorm and they are asking themselves some tough questions as they should. You know, they have responded. Unfortunately, in some cases, it's a little too late. Uh, Cambridge Analytica has already happened. Mm. Russians have already meddled in the election via Facebook's platform. Uh, but that's not to say that Facebook isn't now springing into action. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg have an incredible partnership, which is very unique in Silicon Valley because very few women have cracked or shattered the glass ceiling as, as Cheryl Sandberg has. What's interesting about their partnership is that, you know, Mark made as much space for Cheryl as she made for him, and they really do bring different perspectives and different skill sets to the table. Um, they both have some hard questions to answer right now about how Facebook is going to continue to leverage our personal information for you know monetary gain and i think that you know facebook rightfully has had a bit of a wake-up call um you know not for, not as a result of any bad intentions um but you know as a result of the, the evolution of technology and i do think that facebook is a perfect example of why we need different perspectives of people men and women people of color people from around the world to be building these companies because they are so incredibly 
powerful. And you know, you mentioned I have three children. You know, this this matters because um, Silicon Valley is only changing our lives more every day. And you know, facial recognition technology is already, to a certain extent, sexist and racist, and doesn't recognize women and people of color as easily as it does white men. Um, and these technologies are, are only going to become more influential. So, you know, this is an industry that needs change simply because of, of the power it has over our lives and over over the next generation. And, you know, as I said earlier, I'm optimistic. I don't think I could have written this book if I didn't have hope. Mm. Um, I'm optimistic that the industry will change and will improve and that the products and services that we all use every day will be better as a result of it. Uh, okay, Emily, I think we have one minute left, and uh, I just would like to ask, is there anything about Hawaii that you brought to your business and your understanding and to your work that you'd like to tell us about? A little aloha. <laughs> um, you know, I try to have a sense of, you know, genuine curiosity, and I, I really am genuinely curious about the people and, and, and the companies that I, I bring onto the show. And I think it's so important when you are a reporter and you are telling stories and sharing them with the world. And I'm, I'm sure part of that has to do with growing up in such a wonderful and inclusive place. And, you know, Hawaii is, is in a way, it's a great model of, 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 a, of a true melting pot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so many wonderful and colorful cultures coming together. And I think that's probably part of the reason that I've always been interested in, in this topic and, and why I believe diversity of thought is so important. Well, Emily, uh, thank you very much for your time. Good, good to meet you. I look forward to you coming over back to Hawaii someday. And uh, also have to thank your auntie for uh, her uh, uh, getting us together. So aloha. Absolutely. I have such a wonderful family um, still there. So thank you so much and aloha. <laughs>